Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us at Sincerely Sam Lewis. want to first just take a moment to think about the month that we're in, Black History Month. Uh, today, we're definitely going to be sharing uh, with a particular woman of influence for Black History Month. I'll wait to announce her in a moment, but she's incredible. She once sat on our board. She was our board chair. She's a member of ARC, and she's doing some incredible work in the community. And from the day I first met her, she's always been doing that type of work, just being super incredible. Uh, she's going to be here at 405. And so I want to share, take, them, take this time right now to share an upcoming event that's scheduled for March 23rd, 2023. If any of you follow me on social media, you know that last year I posted that we will be doing a motorcycle ride throughout the state of California, stopping at every single prison in the state of California. Currently, that's 33 prisons at as two of them have closed. So beginning March 23rd, we're going to launch the Freedom Ride, which will be a motorcycle ride, Harley Davidson's preferable, uh, from San Diego all the way to the top of the state to Pelican Bay and back down again, stopping at every single prison and giving you a little bit of history about each one of the prisons, how many people live in the prisons, what type of uh, programming is available in the prison, uh, how long it's existed, uh, and things of that nature, and even some things about the surrounding community. The reason why I want to do this ride is because if we think about our carceral system in this nation, and in California more specifically, 33 prisons, that's a lot of prisons, about 94,000 people in those prisons. What does that say about us as a society? How can we do better? And then as we think about it, and we take this ride across the state, where are these prisons located at? They're located in faraway places that are really difficult to get to sometimes. And if you think about it, this is often a hardship for families. When I go into these facilities, one of the places, one of the things that I often think about is my mom and the 24 years she came to visit with me and my daughter and the 24 years she came to visit me and how difficult it was for them to be able to drive up, sleep in a hotel, come spend time with me, maybe six hours if I stayed out of trouble, an hour if I, if I was in trouble and then administrative segregation or headed to the shoe, and then drive all the way back home. If you can imagine Pelican Bay, you have to fly all the way into Oregon and then it's a two hour drive into the prison or High Desert State Prison. Uh, it's a 13 hour drive from LA. If you imagine the number of hours, the amount of gas, the amount of, uh, amount of money it costs for families to get to these places and so, on March 23rd, I want to ride to every single one of these prisons and lift up the humanity that are behind these prison walls and also lift up the work that ARC and many other organizations have been doing to make these places more compassionate, decrease the number of people that are currently in these places and create a pathway for people to come home and never return. And so come March 23rd, that's what we'll be doing. You'll, you'll hear more about this in the coming weeks. You'll see some things posted on ARC social media. You'll see some things posted on my social media. Matter of fact, tonight I got a thing. Tonight I think I'll post the first uh, images of what our logo will be for the Freedom Ride in 2023. And with that, if you have questions, tag me on social media, hit me up. Nick, if you can put my social media tags in, in it, on the screen and people can follow if you're interested. And just know this is being done to lift the humanity of people that are currently incarcerated inside state prison in the state of California. With that said, now I want to talk a little bit about our guest who will be joining us shortly. Um, Charity Chandler Cole, who was our last chairwoman, I was about to say chairman, our, our last board chair. Charity was our chair for the last four years prior to our current chair, Brad Slater, and, and Charity served eight years on our board. Prior to that, she was a member and still continues to be a member of ARC, as, a, as am I. Uh, and then she's done some incredible work in the community. Uh, she leads CASA now, an organization that I'll, I'll lead to her to talk, to talk about, and just being a powerhouse during the 2020, uh, uh, what I consider uh, uprising, Charity was out there leading the marches, like being a voice for our community and really being active in helping change a number of different things in our community, including uh, 
bringing to the table and changing the way funding is allocated here in LA County. And so I'm looking forward to Charity joining us shortly to talk about what she's doing now and what her future looks like. She's also currently in school, which I don't know how she, she does it. Like she's got children, she's worked, she runs an organization, she sits on boards, she does everything. And I'm like, how do you do that nonstop? And so simply what it is, is that she's just a powerhouse. And so when she gets on, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so she should be logging on right now. Uh, oftentimes when you have superheroes that are doing so many different things to take a moment to be able to join me on this means a lot. And so as he joins us today, we're going to be talking about Black History Month and women of, of influence. And if you think of in the past, some of the women of influence that we often talk about, like Rosa Parks, but even if we go further back, like Sir, Sir John or Truth and so many others that have fought to make this country a better place, uh, have fought for our civil rights, have fought for women's rights, have fought for women's rights to vote. There's so many different things that women have given to us as a community, as a country. And I, my mom always comes to mind, a uh, really strong black woman who raised four kids on her own without any help, uh, worked. Sometimes she worked 16 hour days, sometimes, uh, she would have to go back to work and work more hours than 16. She'd come home, eat after 16 hours, and then have to go back to work. Raised us, owned her own home, and now finally was able to retire and, and currently is, is uh, in a battle with cancer. But my mom was one of the first uh, superheroes that I ever knew in my life. And so I'm being told here she is. But just, hey, Charity, how you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm sorry. It's all right. No, you just don't know. I just got through uh, announcing all of it, giving you a, a bunch of different accolades. Uh, <laughs> basically, you're, you're what I would consider the Black Wonder Woman. Uh, you're in school. I shared that you had been on our board. You you were a founding member of our board for the, uh, the first eight years. Yes. Uh, now you lead CASA. You're in school. You're yes. raising children. You're traveling. You're doing How do you do it? Like, I don't think about it. <laughs> don't think about it. So, so, so I, I wanted to give you a few minutes to like introduce yourself. Uh, how are you doing today? And introduce yourself and tell us a couple of things that, that are top of the mind just for you. We're discussing Black history and women of influence, Black women of influence, and you definitely fit in that category. Well, just first, thank you, Sam, so much for having me here. I will always show up for ARC, and I'm just so grateful for all the work that you do and that the organization does. I'm Charity Chandler Cole. I am the CEO of CASA of Los Angeles, which stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. We show up in life and in court um, for our most vulnerable and underserved populations of children that are impacted by the child welfare and the juvenile justice systems. I'm also a commissioner for LA County Children and Families and co-chair of its first ever Racial Justice Committee, and I I also serve as an on the African American Advisory Board for District Attorney George Gascon. I'm extremely excited to be here. What makes it easy when you list all those titles and all the work that I do, uh, when you're passionate about something and it's so in kind of intertwined in not only your life's work, but things that we are literally still being impacted by today, it almost doesn't seem like work. It just seems like a necessary ingredient to advance um, all of our collective, um, all of the collective work we're doing. So I'm just grateful that I have a voice in this space, even though I've had to fight for a voice since we're talking about black history in this space and that I'm able to use the many platforms I'm on to not only help change and influence policy, but also just show what it means for people with lived experience like myself, like Sam, to not only serve our issues at the bottom, but lead them at the top. So glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. For that. So, so now audience, you know what I mean when I say superwoman doing all these different things and yet, Still, like, still having time. Uh, the, the other day, you were here with your daughter, yes. uh, who, I, who I was calling Little Charity. It's, it's yes. your daughter. Oh, she loves it. Yeah, she loves that. <laughs> uh, and so, tell me, uh, for you, what does Black History Month mean for you? Oh my gosh, Black History. So I want to take a step back and just acknowledge the fact that Black History didn't mean a lot to me growing up because I didn't know about 
our history. It's not, you know, I didn't come from a family where we talked about our history around the dinner table. We didn't talk about our struggles. We definitely didn't talk about all of the sacrifices that were made for us to be where we are today. And so as a result, just took so much for granted, but also just didn't understand how bomb, you know, we are and how not only hard we've worked, but how resilient we've been in the face of incredible injustice. And when I learned about Black history and I started to really just entrench myself in learning and understanding, you know, I realized that Black history to me means staying rooted and grounded in the sacrifices, the horrors and oppressions that, you know, our communities, our families, our ancestors have faced, but also, you know, giving me the ammunition, dare I say, um, the motivation and the inspiration to keep fighting realizing that it's a marathon at the end of the day and we cannot take for granted all the work that's been done but rather you know there's a saying we are our ancestors wildest dream and for me that means acknowledging our black history but continuing to create history and be a part of black history um and then teach it to our kids and make sure that we aren't erased because there's a lot of erasure happening right now and so making sure that our history lives on because we can't change our future um, we can't reform anything. We can't even abolish anything if they're trying to say it didn't exist at all. So it's being able to maintain that and continue, um, you know, telling those stories and fighting for change. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I want to really just touch on that. Right now, I think the most important thing that, that as a country we need to do is just accept our history for what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to learn from our history. What I remember reading some time ago, people are doomed to make repeat mistakes that they made because they don't know about the mistakes they made in the past. And that's that's history. Like if you don't know what your history is, you will repeat them. If you don't know the wrongs that were done, you will repeat it. And so for people not to want to put into textbooks for our young people to learn about history, it's just the truth. That does not mean that I'm going to hate someone or anything like that. It's merely wanting to be able to understand what was the history that created this country. Yeah. And I also want to say, just from my perspective, and, and some might not agree with me on this, like, I think the Constitution is one of the greatest documents that was ever written. It just was not applied correctly. I think there are a couple of small edits that need that to be added. Like, instead of saying all men are created equal, it should be all people or all human beings are created equal. Uh, because equality is something that, that we still don't have uh, uh, fully uh, in, in this country. Yeah. And so uh, I think this it's important to know that because of a living document, it can change. Yeah. And, and that's and that's I just want to also point out that that's by design. You know, when the framers were writing and creating and drafting the Constitution, we weren't a part of that. They were very much aware of slavery, the implications of slavery, that equality wasn't actually something they were actively practicing when it came to black people. But as long as they carved us out and excluded us and really looked at what equality meant for a specific group of people, then yes. And so, you know, I think it's so important that we touch on the fact that it is a living document and it can be changed. You know, I, I personally hate when I hear people say, well, that's not constitutionally something. I'm like, what? Are we really talking about something that's old that needs to be changed? Or are we going to say we need to recreate a new constitution? We need to really look at and situate life um, in society how it is today and just create something new. And, I, and I'll just throw out there, everyone, I am an abolitionist. I am I am not a reformist. I am someone who believes that we just need to start over. We just need to own our shit and say, you know what? We messed up or we didn't mess up. We purposefully went this route and we're going to purposefully change it and just create something new and all together. But yeah, it's a very strong document. It's what built our country. It's what allowed you know slavery to persist. Um, but it's about time that we actually, you know, do, do a completely up um, upheaval of the Constitution and write something new. But anywho, I don't want to dwell too much on the Constitution, but yes, let's so, not erase our history. <laughs> absolutely. Not. So, so tell me, Charity, is there a woman figure that that or figure or figures that have, that have inspire you that have, that inspire you not just today but both historically but also today? So what's funny was growing up, I 
did not see women that looked like me or even know about women in history um, that I could look up to, to aspire to be or to emulate. And it wasn't until I became an adult where I learned about, you know, of course, there's Oprah Winfrey. That was only a lot of women we knew um, that was out there. But I mean, today, I definitely look up to, you know, the Karen Basses of the world. Um, when I met her first, she was just so different when it came to elected officials. She was just so authentic and genuine. And she really cared about, you know, changing our communities. You know, I look up to Ariva Martin. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with her. She's one of my mentors. Um, she's a CNN commentator, an author, um, a journalist, a CEO um, of Special Needs Network. I look up to women um, who are unapologetic, who demand change, who are willing to say the things that need to be said, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it makes your skin, skin crawl a little, even if it causes you to take a pause and do some critical self-reflection. Women who are willing to um, be accountable um, even to themselves. And so when I think of those women, I think of the Karen Basses of the world, the Reva Martins of the world. Um, you know, I, I, there's people at ARC like Zara, who's on here now, women, I've, someone I've looked up to, you know, since starting ARC and just seeing how, you know, passionate they were about this work, about this quest for justice. There's so many women who, it's easy to name the big names and the big figures, but when I look at, you know, the Anna Cho Finleys of the world, the Yanni Bridges, the Shay Jackson, like those are the women who I, you know, look up to, um, even for laterally, because, when we're doing this work, it's easy to get lost in all of the magnificent and big things we saw people even before us do. And then we lose sight of the people who are standing alongside us doing the work. And there's this saying that iron sharpens iron. And for me, when I look for inspiration, when I look for motivation, I look to my left and to my right, because these are the women I know I can call like in real time and say, hey, sis. I need help or I may not have the answer or let, let me know how this sounds. And for me, um, those are the women I, I personally look up to today. Just to name a few, there's so many out there. That's right, uh, shout out, as a matter of fact, so Zira's on our communication team. You can't see her, but she's behind the screen uh, or behind the, the, she heard you loud and clear. Uh, shout out to Zira. And definitely <laughs> a little sister Yanni, uh, uh, miss you. And one, as a matter of fact, we should have pulled Yanni on here. I know you should have. Yeah. Uh, so many. There's too many to name. Too many. So many. So many. Uh, but just know that you are in thought and that we recognize you and we see you. Uh, tell me this. As a, as a woman of color, or throughout your, your journey, what has helped you build confidence and resiliency? What has really strengthened you through all of the difficult stuff that you have to face day in and day out? So for me, it's my children, definitely. My children... Um, really motivate me and give me the drive, not because they're just beautiful, cute kids. It's because I'm terrified of the world that they're growing up in. And I've always had a spirit of defiance where, you know, if you tell me I can't have something or do something, I like to prove you wrong. And I know there is a saying that we don't have to prove anything to anyone. But for me, you know, especially being, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it, I was in the foster care system, was in the juvenile justice system and being told so many times what I can't do, what I'm not capable of doing, uh, what I'm not worthy of a doing. That word worthy just used to drive me crazy. And for me, wanting to prove them wrong um, and, 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 and questioning, you know, all of these just negative thoughts and feelings that um, were thrown at me constantly and consistently. And I actually went through an exercise to build my confidence to speak life into myself. And it was after um, I gave birth to my son um, at 18 years old. And I had to, you know, literally go through this exercise that I actually go through with young people today, where I literally write on a sticky note, everything negative that anyone has ever said about me or anything I've ever thought about myself. And I tore it up, burn it. Um, and then I would write positive things on cards, um, things I wanted to be, things that no one's told me, um, things that I didn't even believe were true. Like I was beautiful. I was smart. I was, um, worthy. I was confident. I was all these things. And I went through a whole phase of speaking life into myself because I had hit rock bottom. I was ready to just give up completely and was just constantly being defeated and being told that I would never amount to anything. And I said, well, why can't I? And who said I can't? And who gets to determine my worth in this world? Who gets to determine that I am capable of achieving greatness? And I was constantly on this quest of having other people affirm me or give me validation but I wasn't validating and affirming myself. When I finally start to love myself and I finally start to say, Charity, you are all that in a bag of chips. I started to get so much confidence that 
you know, no one can stop me. No one could tell me what I couldn't have. And I dared you if you did, because I'm going to take it. I'm going to get it anyway and prove to you that I'm not only beautiful, but I'm smart. I'm educated. I'm loving. I'm kind. I'm compassionate. And all that to say is that I, unfortunately, because I didn't have that type of support, had to speak confidence in life into myself. But as a result, um, I'm able to now give that to others and encourage other people to walk in their truth and, um, and in their light and in their love and for themselves. And if you get it from other people, great, but it's not a necessary ingredient to my success. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And then I want to shout out, I was, as, as, you, as you were speaking, I was thinking about our little sister, uh, Raven Nicole, who you fought yes. for. Uh, uh, she's not here, but uh, I, every time I see her with her, her son, uh, you played a key role in helping her reunite with her, her son who was in foster care. Yeah. So I want to just like tip my hat to you. I remember when I reached out, I'm like, hey, like, and like you just went at it. It, it was nonstop. And uh, I know you still mentor her, but yes. I just want to share it with every week, every other week. And, <laughs> and love, love that. And that building that community for all of our young people uh, in community so that they know one, you can achieve whatever you put your mind to, mm -hmm. and that you are loved and that you are beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, as let me ask you this, Charity, as a woman of color. Have you experienced roadblock, roadblocks, com any roadblocks compared to the social norms? Like, could you describe some of those and what, what have they been for you? So all the time, it either had to be, not only was I a woman, but I was a black woman. And then I was also a young woman when I was really trying to find my place in this world and aspire for um, different things, whether it was, you know, being a director in my 20s or getting a certain job that I knew I was qualified for, that I knew I was prepared for and being told constantly to either wait your turn or not right now or you're too young. I remember having a boss tell me when I was asking for a promotion that, I was making good money. I didn't need to, you know, try to be the vice president of this and that. But I was like, well, you, white man, was the vice president of this at a younger age. So why can't I? And really having to check people on their bias, really having to highlight, you know, my worth in, in different spaces and validate myself. There are so many biases and misconceived um, assumptions about not just women in general, but then, like I said, when you add black women in the age, I had to constantly justify and legitimize myself in these spaces even now i'm in school to be a doctorate so i could be dr charity just that's one more thing i can use in my toolbox as to prove why i'm qualified why i um, can do this role because you it's just never enough in certain spaces and so um for me creating our own spaces is just so important you know shirley chisholm there was this um saying that they don't invite you to the table bring a folding chair and i'm like let's just create the table. I'm tired. I'm tired of proving anything to y'all, but there's just so many hurdles when it comes to work, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to advocating from lived experience, advocating in this space, trying to prove why we are the voice you need to hear. You know, normally people want to use our voice to advance their agenda or advance how they want um, advocacy to look in this space rather than, you know, we are the experts. You don't need to go to school for this. You don't need to research us. Make sure we're the ones in these spaces, leading these spaces, our voices are at the table, but even then, you know, sitting on boards in the beginning and committees, and I know you can, you know, you understand this, having to prove why, hey, the quiet girl over here, I actually have something to say, um, and just fighting through that. But I think because folks like yourself and me have been in those spaces and we started off quiet in those spaces, and then we just kind of came in and said, enough is enough, we're going to speak up, it's really allowed the floodgates and the doors to open for so many more people with lived experience where it's, it's a criteria now. Like you can't do anything really in LA County without having someone with lived experience, a part of your work. So there were many barriers and hurdles, but you know, I'm grateful that even though it may have taken us years to get through them and over them, that we've created a space for, for just other people to come in and, you know, we step aside. I'm, I'm our, it, it doesn't have to be me, but let's make sure it's somebody. Let's make sure it's somebody. And, and I think that's vitally important as people come home, making sure that they have the support and, and the opportunities and the avenues for, to lift their voices too. And continuously, uh, one of the things that I often share with, with some of the people that I work with and mentor is California is unique in a number of different ways in terms of the, the, the ability for us to advocate and change so much systematically or, or in the systems in the state. 
we've normalized some things to some extent and we have to be careful mm -hmm. not to think that it's this way everywhere. There are places mm -hmm. that we still need to work on making sure that our voices are centered and lifted. 100%. Yeah. Uh, 100%. And it's not all the way there in LA. Let's be clear right. too. We have to, we still have to demand it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that, that, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you one hundred percent. Is there a piece of advice that you'd like to share with the audience to show how they can support women of color? I think the most easiest way you can support women of color is believe in them. <laughs> Let them do what they. When we say we're going to show up and do something. Believe that we're going to show up and do it. Stop having us jump through thousands of hurdles to prove to you that we're capable of doing it. Oftentimes, I think we lose sight of the fact that women, but people in color in general, we normally have to, you know, there's a saying, we have to work twice as hard as everybody to get to where you're going. We have to work harder, fight harder, pull ourselves up by our imaginary bootstraps. And after we do all that, we're still not good enough. But what people forget is that because we've gone through that process of working harder, working longer, fighting harder, striving, persevering, and being resilient, we're also smarter than y'all as a result. <laughs> we also know more as a result. We're also more prepared and we're ready to go. We execute. We don't really live too much in the planning because we spent our years of justifying and proving to everyone else why we're worthy that we've done skipped the planning phase and we're ready to execute. So when we come in hard and we come in strong, Folks are normally really taken aback and they can't, they're just overwhelmed by our ability to execute, but then also have impact. And so when we mm -hmm. say we're ready, when we say we we got this, we know what we're doing, we don't even need you to hold our hand, just move out the way and let us come do the job. Let us come, let us let and, and I think you know, women, you know, make the best leaders. We lead our homes, we lead our children. You know, the same men, you know, no, no, you know, nothing against Sam, I love you, Sam, but the same men, you know, who um you know, feel that they should be the ones at the top of everything. Who raised you? Your mama. So like that means something like women, we are, you know, by definition, you know, nation builders. <laughs> and so allow us to continue building, trust us to continue building and build with us, build with us. It, it doesn't have to be or either or build with us. Let's build together. That's where real change and impact occurs. I totally agree 100%. Build together, and that's where we build in capacity. Like, just it's, it, it changes systems. Um, and we see that. We see it day in and day out. And to your point, uh, before you came on, one of the things that I talked about was my mom, who raised me, who never gave up on me, who encouraged me to be a lifelong learner, uh, and, and taught me and told me that there's nothing that you can't do. And without her, I don't know where I'd be today. And so, uh, Happy birthday or happy Valentine's Day, mom. Uh, you know, I, that, I, that's my rock. Um, what would you say to, your, to the younger you, Charity, to the younger you, when you're a young person going through all the challenges in, 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 in a difficult time in your life? Oh, my gosh. I would tell young Charity that they were all wrong. Everything they said, everything they told you about not being worthy, about not being capable, they were wrong. And to believe that inner intuition and fire you have and just trust it. Don't question it. Don't try to overanalyze or overthink what it is. Just trust it. Um, I wish, oh, the charity before me knew that she had worth and that she didn't have to try to get that from somewhere else or from someone or something. I wish she'd learn to just love and validate and affirm herself. But I think the most important words she could have benefited from was that all these people in your ear, they're wrong. They don't see you. They don't get you. They don't understand you. They will one day. They will beg for your approval. <laughs> they will beg for your support. But don't believe a word that you hear when it comes to who you are in this world. You believe. tell yourself who you are. Believe in you and, and believe in you. Yeah. Believe in you. Uh, my daughter, uh, daughters, uh, uh, I always tell them, believe in themselves, believe that they 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 can do whatever they put their mind to uh, and don't let anybody stand in your way. But yep. you have to be the driver of your destiny. You have to. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. So for, for our audience, how can 
how can women support other women in, in, in their organizations, but also how can men uh, support women in their organizations, both sides? Like, what would your advice be for both? I think it's so important, especially in the nonprofit space, we've been conditioned to compete against each other, um, whether it's for resources or um, just showing that we're successful at the work we do. And it's been to our detriment. Our goal as nonprofits should always be to build capacity. It shouldn't be that CASA is the best at doing child welfare or ARC's the best at criminal um, justice reform. It should be we all play a role, a unique role in how we show up in this space in support of our larger and broader community. Um, and we all do things a little differently, whether we intentionally want to or not. So how do we come together, have conversations about the work we're doing, really have a safe space to talk about the struggles of this work? I think especially as CEOs and executive directors and people at, you know, you know, leadership levels, you know, we come in feeling like we have to know it all. We have to present as having all the answers and knowing it all. And we can't make mistakes and we can't make mistakes to the point of where we can't ask for help. You know, you said earlier the importance of being a learner. The best leader to me is someone who is in an active state of learning. If you already know it all, then you're not going to get anywhere. There's no room for innovation. There's no room for creativity. There's no room for change. And you're and because you know it all and you're not in a space to learn and to grow, um, you're going to continue to perpetuate um, at whatever's happening in your organization. Oftentimes, a lot of that is rooted in injustice. And so for me, it's so important that as organizations, we build capacity. We figure out how we can help each other. I'm on calls all the day, all day with funders. And I say, you know what? I don't, you know, I don't think this is a good fit for Casa. I think you should go over here and check out Butterflies Haven, or you should check out Treehouse, or you should check out Right Way Foundation. I'm constantly listing other orgs that funders and individuals should invest in or show are partnering with other orgs because it's about building capacity. And so I look at this work as community. What would I want someone to do for me if I was a smaller nonprofit or if I didn't have the funding or if I didn't have, you know, the name recognition, et cetera. And I think when we but we also can't come up with that answer. We have to be in cahoots with each other. We have to have conversation. We have to build capacity. And when we're able to do that, we're no longer fighting each other for resources because we're going to those funders and saying none of us want your money unless you change your funding model and structure to benefit the work we're doing. We're not going to change our mission to get your funding. We're just going to say no as a collective. And now you're sitting here with millions of dollars of other people's money, not knowing what to do with it. And now you're forced to really show up in support of community. But we don't have those conversations um, with each other. And so that's just one of the ways. But I think just working together, working together, um, asking questions, being learners, not coming from a place of knowing it all just because we have that CEO title or executive director title. We don't know as much as we think we know, and we need to always be in a space of learning, of growing. And oftentimes I get the most knowledge from people at the lowest, um, that have the lowest title in my organization. Even today in an all staff meeting, they'll get somebody said something just incredible. And I was like, wow, I never thought about that. And it's someone that you wouldn't even think would speak up on that topic, but they did. And so, being learners, building capacity, growing um, with other communities, community partners. Thank you for that. Um, and just want to touch on uh, oftentimes people or organizations operate out of a position of the belief of scarcity, scarcity of funding. When in fact, if you really study foundations and even uh, like money that's being coming down, that's coming down from the federal government right now in terms of uh, uh, construction and, and new energy and, and there, there, there's there's enough money for all of us to do this work mm -hmm. effectively uh, across the board if we understand that there's no scarcity uh, in fact the way that we should attack this is through unity yes. uh, and, and and that's like funding like learn I would always I, I would suggest to people who are in the nonprofit sector to learn and understand how funding comes from foundations so that you really understand where the money is coming from. Not just that it comes from a foundation, but how does it come from a foundation? Yeah. Uh, Charity, uh, uh, what are you hoping to change for women of color, uh, both now and in the future? 
Well, I would say <laughs> this may sound crazy coming from a CEO because we're supposed to be just robots who just work 50 hours a day and don't take a break. And it, it probably sounds like I work 50 hours a day, but I don't. I would love for our next generation of leadership, even leadership today, to not be so exhausted, not so be, be so tired. This work doesn't have to be as exhausting as it is um, for us to invest in self-care. I can sit here and easily say, I want to, you know, change the world for women. And I want us all to be, you know, in these very high positions, you know, changing the world. But I want us to have rest. I want us to have rest so bad because we need energy to do this work. We need sleep, but I mean unapologetic rest. I want us to give ourselves permission to take vacations. I want us to give ourselves permission to read that book, you know, to sit at by a pool and have have a beverage of your choice, to take the day off to volunteer in your kid's school on purpose, not because you were called in by the principal, to Take a weekday off and go to the doctors and do your DMV and do all the things you need to do. I want women to be in a state of unapologetic rest while still kicking ass in the work that we're doing, having impact and looking good doing it. You know, this idea that we have to look raggedy and tired and exhausted and poor and all of these things doing this work is false. It's a lie that actually maintains you know, the status quo. I want us to come in fully rested, moisturized and happy and changing our communities and showing other folks that, you know, rest is an act of resistance. Eating healthy is an act of resistance. Doing nothing when you feel like you should be doing nothing in that moment is an act of resistance. Loving and showing up for your children and your family is an act of resistance and working on your terms is an act of resistance. And I think by default, we will see a shift in how we do business and how we have impact in our communities. Absolutely. Thank you, Charity. Uh, I have a, a, another question for you. Uh, what is one message or piece of advice that you would give to the next generation of young women of color? The piece of advice, I think it was it's everything that I said, but always bet on you first. Always bet on you. Never wait for anyone's permission. Do what you feel you need to do for you. Be loyal to yourself first. You know, I had this issue with being loyal to organizations, being loyal to people, showing that I was so fully committed to them, even if I fully believed in it, that I wasn't committed to myself. I need younger women to bet on you first. Be loyal to you first. And I'm just going to leave it at that. And you define what loyalty is to yourself. You define what betting on yourself is. It could be saying, I'm, I know what I'm worth. I'm adding tax. And if this is not what you're paying me, then no, thank you, sir. And, and taking those losses because the road to yes is paid with no's. So you really defining what, it, what does that mean for me? But you first. We always put ourselves last. Always. Let's change that. I love that answer. I always tell people I don't gamble, but if I bet, I'm going to bet on me. I bet on me. And I haven't been wrong. I bet it on me for a minute. And I have not been wrong. Yeah. Uh, what is your message to individuals, especially women who are currently incarcerated? <sighs> I would say to women, see, with women, I have, when we offend, um, and offend is the society's definition of what, of, of acts that gets you incarcerated for me. We normally do it out of a need of survival. Either we're surviving domestic violence, we're surviving poverty, we're surviving abuse, we're surviving um, oppression, we're surviving something. We're surviving trying to raise these kids by ourselves because our, our, our significant other is incarcerated. And sometimes we succumb to, you know, substance abuse or other things to try to cope with the pain of the oppression and racism and societal injustice we experience daily. And sometimes when we make bad decisions, it's literally majority of the women out of a need to survive. And I would tell them to forgive themselves, forgive yourself. Don't wait for anyone else's forgiveness. And you'll see a theme about you taking ownership and control, focusing on the things that are within your control. Forgiving yourself is within your control. 
whether it leads to reduced time or not, is, is, is separate. Forgive yourself. Make peace with yourself. Own and be accountable for the things that you shouldn't have done. A hundred percent. But then get into an active space of righting the wrongs that put you in the position to be where you are. And I don't mean the crime or the act itself. I mean the, the feelings of, of worthlessness, of defeat, of denial, of in denial of how wonderful and beautiful and brilliant you are is what I'm is what I'm saying. You know, taking ownership and accountability of, you know, for me believing that I was only capable of crime at some points. I was only capable of certain acts. I was only capable of what the world has said I was capable of. Like there's so much forgiving that we need to do for ourselves, so much healing that we need for ourselves. And sometimes it just, it doesn't come in the form of talk therapy. Make peace with yourself, heal yourself, forgive yourself and ask yourself, not even ask yourself, define what moving forward looks like to you. Yes, you may be in programming. You may be signed up for every program and event offered by all of our wonderful organizations. But what's your plan for you? Once once you get rid of all the noise and all the requirements and everything else, really dig in and say, what do I truly want? What would truly make me happy? And when we drill down to it, sometimes it's, it's the most smallest insignificant thing that we actually have control over. And we don't realize it because we're always aspiring for something so big and so bold and so shiny that others can see that we've changed or we've we're in a better place that we lose that little that little fire um, that's way down there that really is what's going to ignite the real growth and the real change and the real healing. So um, if you're incarcerated and you see this and you're listening, forgive yourself. Love yourself, make peace with yourself. And again, by default, everything else will fall into place. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Charity. Thank you. So remember, and if you have a loved one that's incarcerated, share that with them. Like forgive yourself and love yourself and give yourself the opportunity to be the best version of yourself. Never give up on yourself. We won't give up on you. Uh, Charity, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been amazing. Uh, any last thoughts you want to share with our audience? Oh, my gosh. Um, it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> and Valentine's isn't easy for everyone. Um, please don't get caught up and wrapped up in what society has determined should happen today. What kind of gift you should get, what type of love you should have. Let's love is also an act of resistance. Self-love is an act of resistance. Um, I use the word resistance a lot because I'm in a constant state of resisting everything. That's not for me. Um, love yourself today. Do something special for yourself today. Buy yourself a rose. Buy yourself something to eat. Do some Binge watch that reality TV show you have been waiting to watch. I don't know, but do something for you. Make this year about you on purpose. Love yourself on purpose. By default, you will be loved by the rest of the world. I realized folks started loving me more, treating me better when they saw how well I treated myself. And I was like, oh, that's all I had to do this whole time. So happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Love yourself. You are worthy of love. You are worthy of everything your heart desires. Just, I need you to believe it. I need you to believe it. Absolutely. And you see, uh, Rose, thank you so much, Charity and Sam. Such powerful words. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, this is a wrap up. The second episode of Sincerely with Sam Lewis. We're excited to be back with you in this forum and we can't wait to be back many more with many more illuminating conversations in the coming months until next time everyone take care god bless happy valentine's day and love yourself thank you again charity well, thank you sam all right take care everyone god bless <laughs>